Romans chapter 2 verse 4 uh, says it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. So it's God's goodness that leads people to repentance or to change their mind about it. Okay? So, in the book, I'll tell you to do this. When you pray for a lost person, uh, ask God bless him. Financially in every way so that he can see the goodness of God. He can realize, hey, this is not just happening. God's doing this. It's the goodness of God. I had a lady in Louisiana. She uh, got the book, loved the book. She ordered books for her, her latest prayer group. And they started studying in the prayer group. And uh, then she talked to her pastor to get me to come and teach the material. And so I did. Uh, but anyway, she told me her story. She said, uh, my mom and dad were both Christians. And she said, after my dad died, she said, my mom started living with a man. She didn't marry him. And she, he was not a Christian. They just started living together. And she said, I started praying for my mom because she was living in adultery. And she was just crying out to God, to God for her mom. And finally said, God spoke to him and said, stop praying for her and start praying for him. So she just started praying for the man she was living with. And he had this macho dog. He, he was a big man. He wasn't fat, but he was big. And he had this macho personality. And so uh, she started praying for him. And she was reading the book. And I teach this in the book. And so she said, okay, God, do whatever it takes to save him. And she said that very day he had a massive heart attack and died. She said it scared me so bad I thought I had killed him with prayer. <laughs> they rushed him to the hospital, got him resuscitated. The folk, he was in a coma for 18 days. And when he came out of the coma after 18 days, there was Carol's mother standing by his bedside. He looked up to her face and saw her. He said, we need to get married here in the hospital. <laughs> and they got married. And a few weeks later, uh, probably several weeks later, the pastor called and wanted to come preach a revival to follow up the Praying for the Lost Seminar, which is a good thing to do because uh, if you get to praying for lost people, then you need a harvest event to bring them in. Right? And uh, you don't need it, but it helps. And so anyway, I was preaching revival, and so here comes a man down the aisle to meet me and talk to him. He had a pretty good-sized fellow. He had hams about the size of a ham. I mean, he was, he was, he was not fat. He was just a big guy. And he shook hands with me. And he left something in my hand. I looked. It was a $100 bill. It was the macho man. He not only got married, but he got saved. And he created a ministry for, I guess, his salvation. And he gave $100 for a ministry. But folks, I'm just telling you, uh, you got to put them in God's hand. In other words, why you got to say, Lord, here's my husband. I'm putting my husband in your hands. Do whatever it takes to save him. And mothers... You have a hard time putting your kids in God's hands and do whatever it takes. Because yeah. only God knows what it takes to save them. Now here's a, here's a warning I want to give you. Don't suggest to God what he might do yeah. to get their teaching. Yeah. You don't know what it's going to take, but he does. I was in a church out of Galveston, Texas. We had it on Saturday like this, and they invited several churches. We had several churches involved. And so I talked for a couple of hours, and we had lunch, and uh, like just like we did here, and then I came back and talked for another couple of hours, and and when we finished, the pastor came up to us and said, Brother, there's a lady in my office who wants to see you. And so I went back to see her. She sat in his office crying. There was a man in there with her. I guess it was her husband. And she said, Brother Lee, she said, I came to my pastor. I don't know what church she went to. It wasn't that one. But she said, I went to my pastor and said, Listen, would you help me pray for my son? And she said, he said, Sure, I'll help you pray for him. He said, Let's pray that even if he needs to get paralyzed, he'll get paralyzed in order to get saved, if that's what he needs. And so he... He voiced that. It wasn't really a prayer, but he voiced it as a prayer. And she said, a few days later, my son was in a car wreck. Now he's paralyzed from his dead down. And he's bitter. It, it didn't save me. So here, folks, here's a warning to you. Demons are evil spirits. They're spirits. You can't see them, but they're around. And they hear what you say. They can hear what you say. They can see what you do. If they can't read your mind, but they can hear what you say and see what you do. So you have to be careful what you say. The Bible says the power of death and life are in the tongue. Yeah. Because when you speak negative stuff, demons will hear that and do their best to make it happen. So when this guy thought he was praying, if he needs to get paralyzed, he can get paralyzed, bam, a demon heard that and caused it to happen. And he still didn't get saved. I don't know if he ever got saved. This has been a few years ago. But I'm just saying, don't suggest to God what he might do. He knows what to do. Just put, him, just put him in his hand, okay? Uh, and and that will, he'll take care of the rest. Number eight is urgency. Folks, there's got to be an urgency about what we're doing, what we're doing to win the souls. At the age of 12, Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. 
when Jesus spoke to the 12 disciples in John chapter 4, he said, lift up your eyes, gaze on the fields, look intently at the fields. They are white already to harvest. Well, you know how many people died last year, 2022? 67.1 million. That's how many died last year. That's 184,000 every single day. And missionaries who study this kind of stuff all the time, they estimate only about 10 to 12% of the world's population of the Lord. Folks, there are countries in this world that have less than 1% Christian. Less than 1%. And a lot of folk in America that say they're saved, they don't know Jesus from the signpost. Good to tell you. 184,000 people die every single day, and all of about 10 to 12 percent go to hell. Not just die, hope, but go to hell. And this is an urgency about what we're doing. Yes. When I was a kid, I grew up on a truck farm. We were very poor. We ate pretty good, we raised everything we ate, called and killed rest. And uh, our dad would raise corn, and uh, folks, Corn, when it's ready, you had to get it. And if it stayed a day or two too late, it got too hard and people didn't want to buy it. And I mean, we'd go out pulling corn, pulling corn, pulling corn, and then Daddy would lay it in the grass and let the dew fall on tonight, night, and then the next day, he would take it and sell it. But if you waited a day or two too late, it, was, it wasn't any good anymore. You had to get it. I remember one year, he raised a bunch of okra, and, and uh, he had a deal with a, with a farmer's market. They didn't want it over about three inches long. If it got over three inches, they wouldn't buy it. And every day, Mom, he bought her a case of loads. Every day she'd be out there pulling that okra. Every day she had to pick it or it would get too long. I'm here to tell you, when the harvest is coming in, you forget about everything else. Forget about fishing. Forget about doing anything. Just get out there in the fields and get it in. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. And folks, the greatest harvest in the world are the souls that Jesus Christ paid his death, life, uh, blood for. And he wants us to get out there in the harvest, in the harvest field. And there's an urgency about it. We've got to get out there and get busy. Number nine is the spirit of sacrifice. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15, Paul says, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. So let me tell you what he was saying. He says, I will very gladly spend. That means give all the money I've got. I will spend it for you and be spent. In other words, Paul said, I will make myself coin of the kingdom. I'm willing to give my life for you. And when you get to a place folks, where you're willing to empty your bank account and do everything you can to win souls to Christ, and when you get to a place where it doesn't matter if you live or die, as long as Jesus Christ is magnified through your body, whether it be by life or death, and souls get saved, that's when God can use you mightily for your glory, for his glory. So they, there must be a spirit of sacrifice. Now, several years ago, there was a movie came on called Schindler's List. Some of you may have seen that movie. Liam Neeson was the, uh, the main character. Back then, he wasn't famous. He is now, but he wasn't then. Uh, but Liam Neeson uh, represented Oscar Schindler. And Oscar Schindler had a, a munitions uh, factory, and he was a Nazi, and he was in Germany. But he had his machines calibrated where the, the ammunition he, he uh, made, he manufactured, wouldn't work right, and the guns didn't want people to kill. He wasn't a Christian. He was still a Nazi. He just didn't want people to die. And he didn't want the Jews to die. You know, he ended up killing about six million of them. So uh, what he'd do, he'd just try to save some of them. So he'd go to a concentration camp, talk to the commandant, and in the, in the movie it showed him carrying like a, a briefcase full of money. And so he would pay the commandant for certain prisons. And he had him a list. And I guess he'd get some out of one camp, and, and they'd say, someone would say, listen, my wife is in another camp. Would you save her? My son's in another other camp. So he had him a list. So he would go to the concentration camp. He was trying to buy the people that that he had on his list. And uh, he saved about a thousand of them. Matter of fact, if you go back and study Oscar Channel, you'll discover that the Jews made him a hero. He saved about a thousand Jews from the Holocaust. And they made him, the Jews made him a hero. They went and got his body and buried his body in Israel. And they made a statue to him. Because uh, they, they reverenced him for saving a thousand of their people. You know, during that time. And uh, toward the end of the movie, Schindler's a counter comes up to him and says, hey, do you have any money to put back? Because he was wealthy. He said, no, I don't have anything to put back. He said, well, uh, 
You're busted. You're broke. You don't have any money left. You spent all your money on these Jews, <laughs> buying up these Jewish prisoners. And he'd buy them and put them to work in his, in his munition factory. So the commandant just thought he was getting cheap to flay labor, but he wasn't. You know, he was just trying to keep them from being killed. And all through the movie, Schindler is wearing a, a gold lapel pen, a Nazi pen. And when his accountant said, hey, you don't have any money left, instead of Schindler getting mad and said, hey, I wasted all my money. No, no, no. He pointed to this gold pen. He said, I could have saved one more. He still had something of value that he had. He said, I could have saved one more. Now, folks, listen to me. Schindler was not even a Christian. And he wasn't saving the Jews from hell fire. He was just keeping some of them from being killed by Hitler. And he was a Jew. He was, I mean, he was a Nazi. He wasn't even saved. But he was willing to spend all of his money and give everything, the worth anything he had, just to keep somebody from dying. And then the Jews hated the Nazis, not to take the Jews. But he, he was saving them. That's what I call a spirit of a sacrifice. Now here's my question for you. Listen to me closely. If you could save someone, it might be your husband, your son, or daughter, or whoever, mother, dad, if you could, now you can't, and I'm going to tell you why in a minute, but if you could save someone, how many of you would do it? Okay. Now watch this, folks. You can't because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Jesus had to shed his blood for us to be saved. So in order for you to save someone, if you could, you'd have to die in order to do it. But here's the point. Your blood won't work. My blood won't work. Only the blood of the Lord Jesus. So you can't save somebody. But what I'm saying is if you could, you'd have to die to do it. You'd have to shed your blood. You hear what I'm saying? Now here's the thing, folks. <laughs> You may not love somebody enough to die for them, but do you love them enough to spend a day or two fasting and praying? Do you love them enough to turn the TV off and just spend some time crying out to God? Did you love them enough to call a friend or a family member and say, hey, would you help me pray for my husband? He's going to hell. Would you get, would you get somebody to keep your kids when they come in from school so you can lock yourself up in a prayer closet somewhere and just cry out to God for your husband? How much do you love somebody to keep them from going to hell? Here's what I've discovered about our ministry as far as I can tell. For every dollar that comes into our ministry, three lost people get saved somewhere in the world. For every single dollar that comes in, at least three lost people get saved somewhere in the world. It's just been an incredible thing to see what God's doing. When those little yellow books go out, people get saved. I read some testimonies this morning. People get saved. People get saved. Paul Wright, I think it's the Philippian church, he said, you know, I want this offer for myself. He said, but I want it to go to your account. So when you, when you give money to ministries that seek to get saved, you get credit for that when you get to heaven. They that turn many to righteousness shine as the brightness of the front forever. But when you get to heaven, your legacy is going to be how many souls were saved as a result of what you did here on earth. That's it. That's it. That will be your eternal legacy. And uh, so you have to get involved in doing doing God's work in that in that way. Now then, those are some points on how to pray for lost people. Now let me let me tell you why we must pray for lost people. The very first verse, uh, not verse, but sentence in, in the book says. If we don't pray for lost people, then we'll get saved. I've had so many people talk to me about that, disagree with that, but folks, it's still true. So I'm going to give you the reasons why we must pray for lost people or they won't get saved. Number one, and this you won't find this in the book, so you might want to write it down. Number one, God, prayer is God's appointed way for us to get all things from Him, which includes souls being saved. So God, prayer is God's appointed way for us to get all things from Him. James 4, 2, you have not because you... Ask them. So you've got to ask it. Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. In everything. That includes souls being saved. 
First Timothy chapter two, verses one, three, four. You can jot this down and read it all later. I'm just going, I'm going to skip part of it right now. Paul says, I go therefore that first of all, and that means first in time, first in priority, first in everything. He says, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And then he tells us why. For God would have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So Paul tells us to pray for everything, everybody, because God wants them to be saved. Now, famous Christians understood this. Famous Christians understood this. I want to read you some quotes from people some of you are going to recognize. Anybody recognize John Wesley? I want you to know what John Wesley said. He said, God does nothing in the affairs of men except in response to believing prayer. And even those who have been saved without praying for it themselves, which is exceedingly rare, will not without the prayers of others. John Wesley said, unless you pray for people, they're not going to get saved. Anybody here ever hear of Charles Stanley? Yeah. Just went to heaven recently? I want you to hear what Charles Stanley said. He was known as uh, uh, America's pastor. Charles Stanley said, we have only one weapon. It is not preaching, teaching, singing, or organizing. It is the word of God brought against Satan's lies through prayer. Amen. Now listen to this. Charles Stanley said, if we don't pray, we see we serve no purpose Amen. in God's framework of eternity. That's pretty strong. Sammy Tippett. You may not have heard of Sammy, but Sammy is an international evangelist. He's a Southern Baptist. And that's one reason I got him on here because uh, he came to Monroe, which is where I'm from, in 1966. And that's where his first great revival was. He started out in a little small church, and it grew so much it had to move to the Civic Center. And I don't know how many hundreds of people were saved, but it was an amazing thing. But here's what Sammy Tippett said. He said, perhaps there are no conversions in our churches. Because we have not seen how impossible it is for the non-Christian mind to believe. It is only when God opens their hearts to understand the message of Christ that they can accept Him. And hearts will be made receptive only as we pray. And folks, Sammy Tippett has been all over the world preaching the gospel. He, he's gone to the country that was close to the gospel. And somehow God would get him in there. And he would preach and multitudes would be saved. Jack Taylor, another well-known Southern Baptist, uh, written books on, on evangelism and stuff. Here's what he says. He said, The greatest need in the program of New Testament evangelism is that of intercession. Intercession is the currency of our lives placed in God's hand to be spent for the purchase of souls precious to Him. F.J. Hugel. I love his stuff. Listen to what F.J. Hugel says. He says, Intercession provides the necessary basis for God to work. It is not folly to say that without intercession, God cannot work the things He wants to do in the salvation of sinful men. Now listen to this. This is what F.J. Hugel said. God limits Himself to our intercessions. That means, folks, if we don't, He won't. If we don't, He won't. If we don't pray, he won't save. He depends on our intercession. Anybody ever hear Charles Spurgeon? Oh, yeah. <laughs> if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. If they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees. Let no one go there unwarned and unprayed for. And then listen to what Spurgeon says. He says, whether we like it or not, asking is the rule of the kingdom. He said, if we may have everything by asking in Jesus' name and nothing without asking, I beg you to see how absolutely vital prayer is. One last one. Andrew Murray is one of my favorite authors. I want you to hear what Andrew Murray said. He said, when will Christians learn the great truth that what God in heaven desires to do needs prayer on earth as its indispensable condition? As we realize this, we shall see that intercession is the chief element in the conversion of souls. All of our efforts are vain without the power of the Holy Spirit given in answer to prayer. Andrew Murray said, if we don't pray for lost people, they're not going to get saved. These other preachers said the same thing. I'm not the only one that said this. 
I'm just here to tell you, they knew. These guys were great men of God. They knew if we don't pray for lost people, they're not going to get saved. Now, here's the second thing why we must pray for lost people, and that is we must pray down the will of God. Did you know, folks, God's will does not automatically happen? It doesn't. It does not automatically happen. Uh, for example, abortions. In Job chapter 3, verse 3, Job says, Let the day perish when I was born, and the night in which it was said, There is a man child conceived. Now, what's important here, folks, is a man child conceived. So, what the Bible is saying is the moment Job was conceived, he was considered a man child. Amen. He was not some kind of fetus or something that you could throw away until they got to the birth canal. No, no. The moment he was conceived, God says he's a man child. And then listen to what Jeremiah said. God spoke to Jeremiah. He said, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Listen to this, folks. Jeremiah was a prophet before he was ever born. He had nothing to do with it. God did. So don't tell me he wasn't he wasn't a person. No, that won't fly with a book. Gay marriage, that, that's got to be a big thing now. Folks, I'm just sorry, but here's what the Bible says. Leviticus 18, 22. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Leviticus 20, 13. If a man also lie with mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And folks, the word abomination means to loathe, to detest. It means wickedness. It means disgusting. That's what the word means. So I'm here to tell you, there's a lot of gay marriages going on. But it doesn't line up with the book. It's not God's will. A lot of babies are being aborted, but it's not God's will. You understand what I'm saying? That's right. <laughs> so we have to pray down the will of God. It does not automatically happen. Matter of fact, Jesus taught us to pray down His will. Matthew 16, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth. As it is in heaven. Jesus told us to pray down the will of God. Now, my main question is, what is His will? Well, there's a lot of things in will, but I want to read just one thing. Guess what it is? 2 Peter 3 9. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Well, God is not willing that any should perish. No matter if they're atheist or communist or Muslim, it doesn't matter. Man won't work. God is not willing that any should perish. He loves everybody. Amen. I probably prayed this prayer, folks, thousands of times. I, I pray, Lord, help me to love all people like you do. Help them to love lost people like you do. Help them to love lost people like you do. And folks, if you'll start praying that prayer, God will give you love for people. And since I started praying that, I've been in, Lord, help me love church, church people too. Because <laughs> 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 some of them aren't very lovely, you know. <laughs> folks, listen to me closely. If God would save just one person without our involvement, he would save them all. If God would save just one person without any involvement, he would wait for us to do our part. Here's the number three why we must pray for lost people. God expects us to pray for the lost. He expects us to pray for the lost. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. God has given unto us, you and me, the ministry of reconciliation. So he's given us a ministry. What is it? Reconciliation. That means bringing God and man together. And uh, and now that we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. So God's given us the ministry of reconciliation. He made He's made us ambassadors, and an ambassador is the chief uh, uh, appointed person from one sovereign nation to another. And so God has appointed us to be His ambassadors on earth. That's as high as you can get. And our job is to represent heaven on earth. That's what we're about. Mm -hmm. Now folks, listen to this. Cornelius was praying and fasting and seeking God. And God sent an angel to Peter. I mean to Cornelius. And said, Cornelius, send for Peter. He'll tell you what to do. Did you know folks, an angel can't tell a lost person how to get saved? That's not his job. That's not his job. 
God sent an angel to Cornelius and said, send for Peter. You'll tell you what to do. I can't tell you what to do. Peter can. And Cornelius sent for Peter. And Peter's up on the house stopped praying. And God speaks to him and says, hey, the three men are looking for you. Go with them. Down the he goes to the home of Cornelius, which Jews didn't do in those days, go to the homes of Gentiles. But when you become a Christian, you're not a regular Jew anymore. You're a Christian. And when Peter started talking about Jesus, the Holy Ghost fell upon them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. They were saved just like that. Man, I like to preach some services where everybody just can say, the Holy Spirit just falls, everybody gets saved. Yeah. We go home to eat lunch early. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the Ethiopian here came to Jerusalem looking for God. Nobody helped him find God. He was going home lost, riding in his chariot. Somebody had gotten a copy of the book of Isaiah. He was reading the book of Isaiah. And God spoke to Philip and said, Philip, go out in the middle of the desert. And he didn't know why he was going out there. And by the way, Philip had a thriving revival going on. When God said, leave this and go out in the middle of the desert. Uh, you laymen may not understand this, but it's hard for a preacher to leave where God is really moving and working. He goes to work out in the middle of the desert, you know. But he did. And he got out in the desert. Then the angel said, you see that chariot go gun yourself to it. So he did him a little car jacket and jumped up in that chariot with this guy. And uh, saw what he was reading, the book of Isaiah. And uh, Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch said, how can I, except some man should guide me? Well, God has given us men and women, boys and girls, He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. Angels can't do it. All they can do is say, send for somebody, you know? And, and that's what we got. you understand what I'm saying? Amen, brother. <laughs> Amen. Now here's my point. My third point is why we must pray for lost people. God expects us to do it. He expects us to pray for lost people. Now folks, listen to this. Isaiah 59, verse 16. God saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercession. Now I did a little study on this in the Hebrew. And the word for no man, it means not exist. In other words, uh, it's there was no man there that was, that was what God wanted. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercession. All of Israel, he couldn't find a single intercession. And uh, and the way that this is written in the Hebrew, no man, it means a male in contrast to a woman. In other words, he was not looking for a woman. I don't say that God doesn't look for women. He's used a lot of women through the years. Thank God for women. But in Israel, he was looking for a man to do what he wanted him to do. He was looking for a man to intercede for the nation. And it says, there was none. And the word wondered, he, he saw there was no man and he wondered that there was no intercessor. The word wondered in the Hebrew means to be stunned. He was stunned that there was no intercessor. It means to be appalled. God was looking for uh, an intercessor and he couldn't find one. He was appalled that he couldn't find an intercessor. God himself was appalled. And then the word wondered also means to be astonished. God was looking for an intercessor. And he was astonished that he couldn't find one. That means, folks, he was expecting to find one. Amen? Amen. If he was stunned when he couldn't find one, that means he was expecting to find one. Oh, he expects us to pray for lost people. And that's what an intercessor is, one that praying for somebody else. Let's do Ezekiel 22.30. God says, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. I wonder if God's looking for somebody in the United States right now to stand on the hedge to keep him from destroying this country. Yes. I wonder if he's going to find anybody. Yes. Now here's what I want to say about this, folks. This is really interesting. He says, God says, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge, stand in the gap. That means intercede for the land. That I should not destroy it, but I found none. And folks, the word salt. In the Hebrew, it's got a PL stem, which doesn't mean anything to you. It doesn't mean a whole lot to me. But here's what it does mean in, uh, in, in grammatic. It means intensive, and it means repeatedly. So here's what it says. I intensely and repeatedly sought for a man. Couldn't find one. God said, I intensely and repeatedly sought somebody to stand in the gap, somebody to intercede for the land, and I could not find a single one. 
I did it over and over again. I repeatedly and intensely looked for one and couldn't find one. That tells me, folks, that God expects us to intercede. That's what he's looking for. Number four, why we must pray for the lost here, because of their condition. Folk, lost people are in such a condition they can't help themselves. In John 8, 44, the Bible says, you are your father of the devil. Talk about lost people. Folk, lost people are literally children of the devil. Yeah. That's why a young lady should never marry a man who is not a Christian. Yeah. Because her father law is going to be the devil. And I'm not talking just about her husband's daddy. I'm talking about the devil. Because you just married him for the devil's family. Mm. Acts 26, 18. Paul said God sent me to turn them, the Jews, from the power of Satan unto God. And the word for power is exousia. In the New Testament, there are at least three different words that are translated as power. Uh, one of them means authority. That's exousia is what this one is. One is kratos. That means dominion. Uh, and the one that we normally get is, is, is the one for dynamite. And that's the righteous power. But this is a, this is authority here. Paul said, God sent me to turn the lost people from the authority of Satan unto God. Mark 3, 27. No man can enter a strong man's house. Spoils goods have to be first by the strong man. We talked about that earlier. A lost person is a strong man's house, a demon's house. Isaiah 14, 17. The Bible says he opened not the house of his prisoners. That's talking about the devil here. That means he refused to open his prison and turn the captives loose. The uh, Bible says in Luke chapter 4, one of the things Jesus came to do was to set the captives free. And that's what he sends us to do, to set the captives free. Folks, every person that's lost is under the bondage of Satan. They need to be free. And that's what we got to do. Uh, during World War II, John, Dr., uh, General Jonathan Wainwright uh, was the highest uh, ranking uh, officer ever captured in wartime. I think he was a three-star general. He was captured uh, by the Japanese thrown out of Formosa. And finally, the war was over, uh, but the Japanese commandant didn't let the prisoners know the war was over. So they were still incarcerated. And one day, an Allied plane landed on an island of Formosa, and a captain got out of the plane, walked over to the compound fence, and told the prisoners, guys, the Allies have won, the war is over. And General Rainwright took that little piece of information and went to the Japanese commandant, and he said, my commander in chief has defeated your commander in chief. I'm in charge now. And he took over the prison of war camp. The prisoners went home. Oh, 2,000 years ago, our commander in chief, Lord Jesus Christ, yeah. Amen. defeated Satan Amen. on Calvary. Amen. And now that he says to us, go and set the captives free. Amen. And folks, that's what we've got to be about. That's what we've got to spend our lives doing, setting the captives free. Amen. They can't get loose by themselves. Amen. They need our help. They need our help. Then, the reason we must pray for most people is because of our authority. I've already talked about this twice. I don't you, don't you go a little bit deeper here. Listen to me closely, folks. This is a great point of authority. God never, ever supersedes delegated authority. He never supersedes delegated authority. In Romans 13, 1, the Bible says, With every soul, be subject to the higher powers. And that's authority. The word there is enthusiasm. For there is no power, no authority, but of God. The authorities that be are ordained of God. That means they've been appointed by God. And the word ordained is, is in perfect passive. Perfect means once and for all. Passive means they didn't do it themselves. So God did it to them. And he put it when it was, it was a finished word. Okay? And so, so when God puts somebody in a place of authority, he never supersedes that authority. He never, he never bypasses it. Okay? Now, here's the way it works for us. God gave Adam the authority. There are Genesis 128. God said to Adam, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. And folks, listen to Psalm 115, 16. The heaven, even the heavens, belong to the Lord. But the earth has he given to the children of men. So God gave the earth to Adam and his descendants. The earth belongs to us. But Adam forfeited the authority of the earth when he sinned. And so Satan got it. He became the God of this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 uh, and verse 4. Uh, the God of this world. Satan called the God of this world. Now, in Luke chapter 4, we have a story of, of the temptations of Jesus. Remember three temptations he went through? But listen to this. In verse 5 and 6, Luke 4, 
chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. And the devil taking Jesus up on a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. So the devil took Jesus from this tall mountain, and in a moment of time he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said unto him, All this power, and the word as exousia, authority, all of this authority will I give unto thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. Now this is the devil talking to Jesus. So the devil says to Jesus, I've got the authority of the world. It was given unto me, it was delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. Now both listen to me closely. The word for delivered in the Greek, again, is a perfect passage. Perfect means it's done once and for all it's in. Passive means the devil didn't take it. Adam gave it to him. He forfeited it when he sinned. You understand what I'm saying? It's different here. Mm -hmm. So he said it's been delivered unto me. The devil said the authority of the earth has been delivered unto me. And so it's under my authority. I give it to whoever I want to. And Jesus didn't argue with it. But here comes the good part. <laughs> Jesus took it back to Calvary. Mm -hmm. Now see, since God never superseded delegated authority, He gave the authority there to a man, Adam, and so a man had to take it back. God couldn't take it back. A man had to take it back. So guess what? Jesus became a man. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. For as much sin as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, He also Himself, Jesus, also Himself likewise took part of the same, that through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil and deliver them who through fear of death for all their lifetime subject to bondage. Folks, here's what happened. Jesus became a man and he died on the cross as through death. He might destroy him who had the power of death. The word that for power is kratos. It means dominion. The one who had the dominion of death, which was the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death for all their lifetime subject to bondage. So watch this. I love this word destroy. Uh, destroy in the Greek means to render idle, listen to these definitions, to de deprive of, of force, power, and influence, to annul, to be unemployed, to uh, terminate, and in our day and time, we could say he revoked his license. <laughs> he couldn't operate in the earth anymore. So what did he revoke his license for? What did he terminate for? What did he make an unemployed for? The authority of the earth. So when Jesus died on the cross, well, he took back what Adam lost through sin. He took it back from the devil. And that's why he says in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18, and 19, all authority in heaven and in earth is given unto me. Oh, all authority has always been his. But he gave the authority of the earth to Adam. Adam lost it to the devil through sin. But when he died on the cross, when Jesus did, he says all authority in heaven and in earth is given unto me. So now that Jesus has the authority of the earth, guess what? He gives it to the church. Amen. He doesn't give it to mankind in general. He gives it to the church. He says, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Go ye therefore. So he gives us his authority. Folks, let me tell you right now. You have as much authority as Jesus Christ had when he was here. Because he gave it to you. A state trooper with a badge on his chest, he's got as much authority as the governor's got when it comes to doing what he's called to do. Uh, you've got the authority and, and we've got to use, we've got to use that authority. Now, one, uh, and so he, like I said, he gave, he gave it to the church so we wouldn't go do it. He's given us the keys. We talked about it already. We have the keys to open the kingdom of heaven. Now, one last thing on, uh, on why uh, uh, we must pray for lost people. And, that is, and that, that's because of the power of prayer. God didn't tell us to do something that was weak or worthless. Matthew 21, 22, all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. Matthew 17, 20, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, uh, Be thy removed, hence the other place it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Both prayer, prayer is powerful. James 5, 16, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It does much good. Now listen to this. When the enemy came against Hezekiah, he prayed and God sent one angel in one night and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. Yes. I mean, they had Hezekiah and his people surrounded. They couldn't do a thing. But Hezekiah prayed. God sent one angel one night and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. When we dropped the atomic bomb on Japan, approximately 92,000 people died initially. Some died later of radiation or whatever. 
Folk, 92 and 92 is 184,000. That means the power of prayer is twice as powerful as we're talking about. We ought to be, we ought to be used. We ought to be used. Amen? Amen. Now, one last thing. I'm going to give you four reasons why our prayers sometimes are unanswered. And I'm not going to go into much detail. I'm going to leave a little bit of time for you to ask questions. Here are four major reasons why when we pray for lost people, they aren't answered. Number one is sin. Psalm 6, 618 says, If I regard an equal heart, the Lord will not hear me. Psalm 66, 18, If I regard an equal heart, the Lord will not hear me. Oh, that's pretty strong. Let me tell you a quick story. I used to tell this story in a, in a stronghold session of, 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 pray, of uh, Christians, but uh, I need to tell it right here too. Several years ago, I owed an old doctor bill. And uh, it was told, in my mind, it was totally unjustified. Uh, the doctor did a minor surgery on me that should have never been done. It did me more harm than good. And uh, it was going to cost me several hundred dollars. And matter of fact, he put me in the hospital. The hospital administrator dropped the bill. And the whole thing was a, a farce. So I didn't pay the doctor bill. And uh, God was moving me to another town uh, to pastor. And so I went about to see the doctor. I couldn't get in to see him. So I went ahead and moved. I got to the, my new church. And, uh, and, I, and I've been a soul winner all these years. And every church I've passed, we've won a lot of people to Christ, baptized a lot of people. And so I got to this new church, and man, I, I wasn't seeing anybody get saved. And I'm getting to cry and say, God, I need your power, I need your power. Feel me with your spirit, I need your power to win soul. And the Holy Spirit, every time I prayed like that, the Holy Spirit would say, What about that doctor bill? <laughs> well, by this time, I had learned that uh, the doctor had cheated Medicare, and the government caught him, and so he basically. I think lost his practice, but but when the Lord said, "What about that doctor bill?" I said, "Lord, I'd say, Lord, he, he was a he was a crook and a quack. Yeah. I shouldn't have to pay that bill. Because in my mind, he did me more harm than good. Matter of fact, he didn't do me good at all. But I didn't get any power. So, you know, a few days to walk alone, I said, God, I need power to win souls. I don't see souls saved. And the man, I'm crying out to God for power and Holy Spirit. Say, what about that doctor bill? <laughs> and I said, God, this, this guy was a, a crook and a quack. I shouldn't have to pay that bill. So I didn't get the power. So after a few days, I took around and God, I need your power. I want to see souls say, no fear say, what about that doctor? Oh. I said, God, he's a crook and a quack. I shouldn't have to pay that bill. And I didn't get any power. Now I hope you know as hard headed as I am. This rocked on for several weeks. And I knew I had to have God's power to win souls. And so anyway, I said, well, I'm going to. I'm going to teach my people on Wednesday night. I'm going to teach them how to be soul winners. And I had a book by Oscar Thompson. He's a evangelist and professor at Southwestern Seminary. And he wrote a book called Concentric Circles of Concern. And it was based, based on Acts chapter 2 where the Lord said, uh, You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit come upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem. That was the city they lived in. Then Judea. That was the country they lived in. Then Samaria. That was the next country out. And then to the other most parts of the world. So, you start where you are and you go out. And he got the idea of concentric circles. It's like when you throw a rock in a pond, a uh, circle start going out from where that rock was and they get bigger and bigger and bigger and farther in the center. You cut out a tree, there'll be rings in the tree and set concentric circles. Same thing. So anyway, circle number one was self in Dr. Thompson's book. And so I'm studying the book and I'm going to teach it on Wednesday night and get on one circle at a time. And so uh, I said, well, self is saved. Uh, I don't need to worry about circle number one. I'm going to go straight to circle number two. Circle number two would be your like immediate family. How do you win your immediate family? Your, your children or your spouse, and, uh, you know, so forth. Brothers, sisters, mom and dad, your immediate family. How do you win them? And then the next circle, circle number, circle number three, would be neighbors and, and, and friend, close friends, people you knew. And eventually you're going to have circle number X, somebody you don't even know. How do you win somebody you don't even know the price? And so that's the way it was concentric circles of concern. You start where you are and go out. So I said, well, I'm going to skip circle number one. I'm, I'm saved. And so I'm going to go straight to circle number two. And I'm going to teach my people how to win their family members to Christ. And boy, I'm diligently working on circle number two. And I'm going to teach it on Wednesday night to my people. And, uh, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And uh, he said, what about circle number one? <laughs> and I said, and folks, I talk to the Lord like I'm talking to you. You know what I'm saying? I said, what about circle number one? Because I thought I was all right. He said, what about that doctor bill? <laughs> I 
I'm here to tell you, folks, God would not even let me teach my people how to be soldiers until I took care of the doctor. Amen. I said, God, I'll pay the bill. And I had a wife and four kids. I passed the Baptist church. I didn't make much money. He knew I didn't have the money to pay it. It was several hundred dollars. I said, God, I'll pay the bill. I mean, immediately. I didn't argue with him anymore. I knew it wasn't in the use. He wouldn't even let my people be teaching my people how to witness, win people to Christ. I said, I'll pay the doctor bill. I said, God, I'll pay it. Folks, listen to me. Within hours, a preacher that I didn't even know called me to come preach a revival for him. And the amount of the love offering was the exact amount. Oh, no. I opened up to it. I just wrote a check and sent it off. And folks, that year I baptized 67 people. That's most of them baptized a year. I mean, God was God was used to But he wouldn't let me do it until I first <coughs> took care of Dr. Bill. Even though in my mind it was unjustified, as far as God's concerned, I owed him. And then he Amen. gave me the money to pay it. He knew I didn't have the money to pay it. And he'd give me the money the first time if I would have said, okay, God, I'll pay it, you know. <laughs> I'm just here to tell you, when you're praying, praying when it comes to souls, if there's sin in your life, you got to get it taken care of first. That's just all there is to it. Uh, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not short that he cannot save, neither is ear heavy that he cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and God, and your sins have hid his faith from you that he will not hear. So folks, sin, you've got to get that taken care of if you're going to win souls to Christ. Number two is ignorance. Ignorance. Sometimes we don't know how to pray like we should. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. It says, Likewise the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what to pray for as we ought. Sometimes, folks, we don't know what we're doing when we're praying. Okay? We don't know how to do that. And I want to tell you this quick story. Years ago, when I was still pastor, I, I was teaching this on a Saturday. Seminar had invited other churches to come too. But there was a lady in our church named Michelle Woods. And she was a school bus driver. And so after I finished, finished teaching the session, she came up to you and said, Brother, I'll tell you my story. She said, There are two little teenage boys on my school bus I've been praying for for God to save them. And uh, they were about to have a revival in the church in, in the area. And uh, so she was praying with these teenage boys. And she said, one of the boys, I, I kept trying to pray for I tried to pray for him, but the other one's name would come out. It's like, a, let's just call him Joe and Bill. And she's like, I, I was trying to pray for Joe, but when I voiced it, it came out Bill, you know, instead of Joe. I was trying to pray for Joe, but it's like, almost like God was making me pray for Bill, you know. And then she came back and told me later, said, they had a revival out here, and Bill went to the revival and got saved. You see, God knew that Bill was going to have an opportunity to hear the gospel and he's the one she needed to pray for right then. That doesn't mean she didn't ever pray for Job, but, but in other words, Bill was going to have an opportunity. God knew that. And so he kind of had Michelle praying for Bill even though she was trying to pray for Job. Does that make sense? Yeah. So very interesting. Years ago, I was uh, I was going to preach a revival in, in, in Bastrop, Louisiana. And, uh, but it's one of those revivals where you just preach one night. You know, they have a different preacher every night. And I'm not too much on those because you can't get any continuity. You know, it's just hard to get continuity and as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, I took, you know, I had one night, so I took it. And uh, the pastor was a little bit older, quite a bit older than me. And uh, and we were good friends. I'd preach revivals for him before in churches he'd pastor. Me. And so I went to preach at this revival, just that one night deal. And it was a small church. And, and boy, I was praying. I'd always pray about what God wants me to preach. And, and I was wanting to preach a message of encouragement. Like it was a small church, and I didn't think it probably be any lost people there that night. But I was, I was praying, Lord, you know, and I was wanting to preach a message of encouragement. And God wouldn't let me. There was only one sermon God would let me preach, and it was called "How to Get to Heaven from Where You Are." And because uh, different people are lost, all of them lost in sin, but like like Paul, he was lost in in his religion, you know. And somebody else was lost in his work. Somebody else was lost in something else. So, uh, they're all lost, but the issue was different. Just like I talked about this morning, you know, there's an issue, a different issue that blinds the person to the gospel. Mm -hmm. And so I was going to preach on how to get to heaven from where you are. So it doesn't matter where you are, whether you're lost in religion or you're lost in work, you're lost in something else, it doesn't matter because the, the way to heaven is through Jesus, you know. So anyway, I got to preach that night, and I said, folks, I really didn't want to preach this message. Uh, I wanted to preach a message of encouragement, but this is the only message God let me preach. How to get to heaven from where you are. So I preached the message. Gave an invitation. The pastor came to stand down front. 
And, and here comes a young man, probably about 18 or so, coming down the aisle, and he meets the pastor in front, and they start hugging each other and weeping, and they knelt to off and prayed. Well, when it was all over, it turned out it was the son's, it was the pastor's grandson. Mm -hmm. And folk, his mother played the piano for the church. He came to church nine months before he was ever born. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was in his mother's womb when she said to play and play at the piano. His father was a Sunday school superintendent. He graduated from a Christian school. He went to a Christian school all of his life. And he had made a profession of faith, but he had never met, never met Jesus. And when I got through preaching, he got saved. He got to the pulpit. And he said, Brother, leave that message for me. Because I made a statement. I said, This message is for somebody tonight. I don't know who it is because. It's the only one God let me preach. You see, God knew this young man had been in church all his life and wasn't saved. And I was trying to preach something else, but God wouldn't let me. He wanted me to preach that message because that's what that young man needed, needed to hear. So sometimes we, we pray out of ignorance and the Holy Spirit helps us. And we don't even understand what's going on, but he, he helps us to pray out we need to. Uh, next is unbelief. Matthew 13, 58. The Bible says, Jesus did not bear many mighty works because of their unbelief. Yeah. And that's where Jesus, uh, not long after that, Jesus uh, came down off of the Mount Transfiguration. And he met his father with a demon-possessed son. This is found in Matthew 17. It says, Then came the disciples of Jesus, and Jesus cast the demons out of him. Uh, and they said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, remove hence to the only place you shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto me. So they couldn't cast this, this demon out. They'd cast demons out before, but they couldn't cast this one out. They wouldn't know why. And Jesus said, it's because of your unbelief. Unbelief. So folks, you've got to believe, and I gave you the form of faith already. Uh, sometimes you just really need to hear from God. You need to, God give you a rhema about something you're interested in, and that'll help you. And then number four, last of all, the satanic kingdoms. Well, satanic hindrance. Uh, all prayer is warfare, folks. Ephesians tells us this. Ephesians 6 12. Listen to this. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, and against powers, and against the rulers of the darkness of the world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Five times in that verse, it says we wrestle against, we fight against. Our battle is against demonic spirits. And so here's the thing. The devil will hinder your prayer to be answered if he can. Now, here's especially what Satan hates. He hates kingdom prayers the most. If you pray in little willy-nilly prayers, it's not going to make much in, in difference in eternity. God can probably care less. And the devil too, for that matter. But folks, when you start praying kingdom prayers, I'm talking about things that affect the kingdom. Satan's ears perks up. He hates you to do that. And here are two kingdom matters that's really, really important. Uh, number one is kingdom truths. That's why Daniel had to pray for 21 days. Because he would get the word from God that had to do with the future of Israel. And men are still studying that prophecy today about what's going to happen in the end times. So Daniel was seeking word from God concerning the nation of Israel. And it took him 21 days of fasting and praying because when the angel got there with the answer, he said, I left the first day you prayed, but the prince of Persia, the demon that controlled the entire country of Persia, hindered me. And God had to send Michael, the war angel, to fight and get me through. You see, the devil hates kingdom truths. He hates truths that's going to affect nations and peoples. And that's why it took 21 days for Daniel to get the answer. Not because God didn't send it, because the devil was trying to keep him getting it. And then the second kingdom truth has to do with souls. The devil especially hates when somebody gets saved. And so when you start interceding for souls, you start crying out for souls, when you start fasting for souls, when you start pouring your money into souls, getting saved, the devil hates that. And if he can hinder your prayer from being answered for a little while, he will do his best to do that. But I'll tell you what, greater he that's in us, the hates in the world. Amen. So if you just stay with it, you Christ has already won the battle. You just do a little skirmish down here. It's called warfare. But the devil's already defeated the foe. He knows it. 
You just got to enforce it with the authority. Yes. Come on. Amen. 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 You understand know what I'm saying? Yes. 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 So, uh, that's the fourth reason why I pray sometimes on that satanic hindrance. The devil's trying to keep you from getting the answer because what's coming up is important. Several years ago, the book came out in uh, 2003, so it's been out for 20 years now. Before the book came out, before I even know that I was going to write a book on prayer, uh, God spoke to me one day, gave me a rhyme, and uh, He said, you will reap if you don't faint. I didn't know what that meant. Sometimes God tells you something you don't understand what He's talking about. But God just He just spoke so clearly in my spirit. He said, "You'll reap if you don't faint." Folks, for the next two years, I went through living hell. I mean, the devil assaulted me. He assaulted my family. He assaulted the church I pastored. Uh, I got so weary uh, that if God hadn't given me that word, uh, I would have quit ministry. I mean, I would have worn out. In, in Daniel 7, 15, the Bible says, Satan wears out the saints of God. That's what he did to That's me. Right. He wore me out. That's right. He kept assaulting, kept assaulting everything I touched. He assaulted, and I was just exhausted. And one day I told my wife, I said, i got to get away. And so we drove to the river, Louisiana, which is about 40 miles from where we live. And just to spend the night in the motel, just, I mean, just, I, I just had to get away. And we got to the river, couldn't find the motel room. All the motels were full. <laughs> so we drove on to Leesville. And we found a, found a, found a motel that had a room in Leesville, so we got that room. And both about 4 o'clock the next morning, God woke me up. And I got up and got dressed. My wife didn't even know I was, I was gone. She was still asleep. I slipped out the door, got in my car, and just started driving around the countryside. And I can't tell you what happened. I don't understand it. But in those wee mornings of the hour, I was driving around the countryside of Leesville, Louisiana. God just gave me a peace and a calmness. And just, he just rejuvenated me. He refreshed me. And I went back and was able to stay in the ministry. But not quit. And so every time things got rough, I'd say, God, you promised me I would reap if I didn't faint. And I'm not going to quit. And I stuck it out. So about two years. And after that, the book, God wrote the book through me. And I guess Satan knew more than I did about what was going to happen because uh, the book has gone all over the world, about a million and a half copies. It's in 36 different languages, printed in eight languages. A lot of people are downloading it in China and Mandarin. We got it in Mandarin Chinese. We don't have it printed. We can't get it to print it for us. It's the church underground over there. But they're downloading it and usually using it. And. Uh, uh, so anyway, uh, it's in several other languages that's not that's not in print, and so people can download it. But anyway, God is just doing things, and now and then, uh, the stories I told you this morning, folks, I can stand up here for probably three hours and just tell you story and story and story and story and story about people getting saved uh, because of a little yellow book. Somebody got it, read it, applied the principle, bam, people got saved. And so I have no idea. I have no idea. I won't know to get to heaven what, what it's all about as far as how many souls get saved. But I just know the harvest is coming in. And from the best results that I can see, for every dollar that comes into our ministry, at least three people get saved. And so it's just it's just a good investment if you want to keep investment. But my point is this. God gave me that, that rhema over 20 years ago. You'll reap if you don't faint. Yeah. Folks, I didn't faint, so guess what? Now I'm living on the second half. I'm reaping. And reaping's going on, I don't even know a thing about. And like I told you, the pastor earlier this year got 100 books. He said, the up baptized 219 people three years after you came. I had never heard that story before. I didn't know. Nobody ever told me. And I didn't need to know, you know. I'm just saying that reaping's going on because I, I live by the rain God gave me. I didn't quit. And now then, the harvest is coming in. And I'm praying for a great harvest up here in Illinois. Yeah. And I pray y'all take books with you. I hope every book back here you can take them and get them in the hands of people. I've got some more at home that I can get, so I don't have to hold them back with me. Um, but, but, but use them. I mean, take them with you. Don't, don't take them and put them in your closet and forget about it. But 
But take all you need. Get them in the hands of other people. If y'all want me to come back, I'll be glad to do that. Y'all have been a wonderful, wonderful group, and it's been, a, it's been an awesome thing. Yes, ma'am. He said, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> 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 Thank you, huh? <laughs> I just want to say, Brother Lee, that you are a living example of a sower from the Bible where you're planting seeds. Yeah. And they're growing. But you don't know because there's so many places. I mean, they're everywhere. So thank you for encouraging us. Well, I'm just doing what God calls us to do. So, I thank you. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? Or something? It's not a question, Lee. Thank you, Lee, that you did quit. Yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, listen, y'all do the same thing. I mean, just get with it and stay with it. Come on. All right. We should pray for him. Let me say this. I've got a lot of Spanish books at home. When we got the Spanish book printed, the printer printed either five or 10,000 more than we asked for. And he called me and said, hey, you know, we messed up. I said, well, I'll buy them anyway. So I went ahead and took them. So I've got a lot of Spanish books. And if you want Spanish books, get with your leaders or whatever. Uh, there's 190 in the case, and I ship them by UPS. Uh, so I don't know how much it costs. Usually, I don't know, about 25 bucks or so. I don't even know offhand, maybe more than that now. Folks, it costs us $3.92 to ship one book. If we just ship sent one book. $3.92. I mean, the poach has gone out of the ceiling. We used to send it for $1.62. It's more than double. Um, but when we sell the case, we get to do it UPS and it's a little bit cheap, but it's still pretty expensive. So if you're willing to pay the postage for the Spanish books, you can have them for free. I just want to, want to get them in the hands of people that use them. So you just let me know. Uh, you can call my number. All the numbers on the book. And uh, I don't know if it's on the Spanish book or not, but it's on the English version. And you can call my wife, and uh, I'll tell her what we're going to do. So if you if y'all pay the postage, you can, you can have the books. And you can have any of them. I mean... Uh, we do, we would like to get some some donations for the other three. That to help us get some more printed. But uh, but if you need it, we'll have money. We'll send you some of them too. Uh, but we just want we want to be a blessing. It's what God's called us to do, and uh, and we just want to do it. And if y'all want me to come back, I'd love to do that. For these folks. Uh, we we want to pray for Lee before we say Amen here. Again, 6 o'clock if you want to come back tonight and talk about revival. Um, 